morning. Good morning. Hope you're all doing well today. We continue our study through the book of Hebrews. Today we get into chapter 5. If you remember last week we talked, the writer looked at the rest that God has promised his people, the rest that God has um, promised to those who choose to follow him. And today we go back to Jesus. We look and sorry. Today we look at the priesthood of Christ and what that means for those who follow him. If you follow him, if you remember earlier, we have spoken of how this book was written to a Jewish audience, and so we have to deal with some very Jewish subjects. One of those subjects is the idea. Um, of a high priest and what that means for the worshiper. Because throughout Israel's history, they have always had a priest, they've always had a high priest to mediate between them and God. They could not come to God directly themselves, they needed someone to do it for them. And so today the writer will look at how Jesus is that high priest for us. And he's going to make some parallels, he's going to make some contrasts between the, the priesthood of Jesus and the Levitical priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood of the Old Testament, and what that means for the follower of Jesus today. And so we're going to start in the first six verses here, where we look at the qualifications for a priest under the law of Moses. Because God had some specific rules for, for a priest. And so he says in verse 1, For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. Because of this, he is required, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer sacrifices for sins. And no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was God who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And he also says in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And so we have some basic qualifications for a priest under, under the old law, under the law of Moses. And the first of those is that he must be taken from among men. He has to be a person. A spirit cannot be a priest, cannot be a mediator between man and God. It has to be a human. It seems like a fairly basic qualification. We're not going to nominate one of our cats to be priests. <laughs> but it has to be a person, but it can't just be any person. That person must be appointed by God. And this is an important point even today. Because we have a lot of people running around in the religious world today calling themselves, claiming to be some sort of special priest, some sort of intermediary priest. Declaring themselves reverend or right reverend. Someone who places themselves in a, in a mediary position between man and God. But the writer to the Hebrews is very clear that this position is appointed by God. Man does not take it upon himself. Part of the reason why we see in verses 5 and 6 the writer referencing the prophecies in Psalm chapter 2 and verse 7 and Psalm 110 verse 4 where he says, I have begotten me. You, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The writer is basically saying that God chose Jesus, his son, as a priest under the order of Melchizedek. 
And the writer has to make this point because Jesus was not born to a Levite family. And under Jewish law, only Levites could become priests. But it's not without precedent for God to appoint someone priest who is outside of that lineage, which is why he brings up Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a king priest in the Old Testament. We will talk more about him in chapter 7 because the writer has more to say about him there. But for our purposes today, we need to understand that it was not, like I said, without precedent for God to anoint someone, appoint someone, as a priest or as a high priest outside of Israel's standard rules. And so we have to, so the priest must be a man. He must be appointed by God. But it is, it is also important that a priest be subject to weakness in order to sympathize with those that he serves. In order to have compassion on, in order to be able to connect to the people that he is serving for God. Because the priest generally had, has to deal with two classes of sinners. One of those are the ignorant. Those who sin because they simply don't know the will of God. The other classification of sinner are those who are going astray. Those who know God's word, but choose to do something different. And so the priest has to deal with both of these types of sinners. As we're going to see in the next few verses, this is part of the reason why it was so important back in Hebrews chapter 2 for the writer to prove the subject of Christ being fully man. Remember in chapter 1, you talk about Jesus being fully God, and in chapter 2, you talk about Jesus being fully man. This is part of that, this is part of the reason he had to do that. And so in the next few verses, starting in verse 7, speaking of Jesus, he says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him, called by God as high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. So you see, what we need to understand here is that Jesus' humanity qualifies him for the, for the office of high priest. Again, what we talk about in chapter 2. Jesus had to become a man if he was going to be our high priest. He had to become a man if he was going to be our mediator between us and God. We have one mediator between us and God, and that is Jesus Christ alone. That position is reserved for him alone and for no other person. He is our High priest. He is our mediator. But remember, the priests had to be subject to weakness. They had to deal with the day in, day out situations of the people that they were serving. Can you imagine how a high priest would act, how a high priest would treat people who had never had any difficulty in his entire life? He was born into a nice, soft bed, never had no hardship, no pain, no suffering, was never tempted, never had any struggles in his life. He's not going to, this is not going to be an effective priest. Because he won't be able to connect, he won't be able to sympathize with those he's serving. Oh, you're, you're being tempted by 
like that. That's and that's nuts. Oh, I'm sorry. You're struggling. You shouldn't have to struggle. You should only be happy and joyous all the time. My whole life is that way. Yours should be too. It's not the real world. The real world is it? And so as the writer made earlier the point that the priest had to be subject to weakness so that he could sympathize with the people, so Christ had the full range of the human experience. See, Jesus offered up prayers. And the word used for prayers here is really has a meaning of request from a deep sense of need. A deep sense of need that they cannot fulfill themselves. They must rely on God to help them to carry them through this. This is what the prayers here is talking about. But not, he not only made prayers, he made supplications. And supplications are requests from a deep sense of helplessness. That point where there is nothing left to do, there is no strength left, there is nowhere left to go, there is nothing but darkness and tempest and pain, and there is nothing you can do but bow yourself before God and beg for His mercy. There you go. There you, go. you know that Jesus encountered these things, that He did these things. I believe He did these things more than just in the garden at the end. How many times do we read that Jesus left everyone to go and make prayers? To go and spend time with his Father in heaven. See, Jesus encountered real life and made them able to sympathize with us in our struggles. Jesus was not born to a high-placed, wealthy king where he had all that he desired all the time, where he was calm, where he never had to struggle or deal with anything. This is not the life that Jesus led. He was born to a very dangerous and volatile situation. He lived a life filled with hardship and temptation and struggle. And now we have an assurance that Jesus can sympathize with us in our temptation, in our persecution, in disease, in all the hardships that we face in life. Jesus knows it. He has been there. He can sympathize with us in our frustration. Read through the Gospels. Look for times where it seems like Jesus might be a little bit frustrated. You'll find it. He cried to God for three times for an escape from the cross. But the answer remained no. He is frustrated by the teachers of the law, those who should have known better. He is frustrated by his own followers. As Jesus is going to Jerusalem at one point, he, he mentions that he is going there to die. Peter steps in front of him and says, no, this is never going to happen. Don't do this. That's some of his closest inner circle. He has to tell Peter to get behind me, Satan. Strong words. But that was a temptation. See, Jesus claimed no exemptions as a son, but rather obeyed in reverent submission to God. After fasting for 40 days in the wilderness, but right before he starts his ministry, just after he's been baptized, when Satan comes to tempt him, what does he say? They say, I'm the son of God, I'm exempt from this, go away. No. He has to sit there and face it. When someone says they will follow him wherever he goes, and he says, foxes have holes in the ground and birds, and the birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. What? He says, 
that instead of saying, well, I'm the son of God, so I can go anywhere I want. I can just make a bed and be comfortable right here. I'm good. No. Because I have nowhere to lay my head. See, Jesus did not exempt himself from the human experience. He never said, I'm the Son of God, so I can have whatever emotions I feel like today. He didn't say, I am the Son of Man, so I will fill my belly and keep myself content. <clears throat> no, he rather obeyed in reverence, submission to God. The word here is really eulambeus. And it means a godly fear and respect, a deep religious devotion to God, and complete submission to Him. It kind of boils down to an attitude with which an individual conducts a perilous mission. And Jesus poured all of His resources into completing His terrible mission. you are struggling when all seems lost, when all hope is gone, when the darkness surrounds you, when the void opens up inside, when everything is falling apart, when your friends have abandoned you, when you have lost everything, Jesus is there. And he knows what's going on. And he knows what that means for your life. He knows what that feels like. See, we do not have a God who sat up in heaven, looked, sent us out free on earth, and said, eh, don't figure it out. I don't have to worry about it. We have a God who loved us so much that he came and experienced what it means to be a person and have to rely on Him for everything. That is the God that we serve. That is the sacrifice that He made. In that sacrifice, Christ's obedience made Him functionally perfect as our sacrifice and priest and left a path for us to follow Him in. This is not just... I, I, by. By functionally perfect, I don't mean morally. Jesus never sinned. He had no moral issues. And he suffered for not giving in to temptation. But as a sacrifice, he was made functionally a perfect sacrifice who could be, bring us to God. And Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses... 21 through 23. That Jesus is saying, For to this you are called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Who committed no, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges right righteously who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Christ learned what it is to obey completely as a man. He learned the suffering, the hardship, the heartache, the destruction that it means to follow God completely <coughs> as a man, as a human being. And as such, he now has the right to call us to do the same. God had that right anyway, correct? Yes. He's king of all creation. He has created us 
He already had that right, and he had solidified that by sending his son to live here, to deal with things as a man who had to rely on him for everything. To show us what that means, to experience firsthand what that is. And as such, we now have a high priest who can truly sympathize and have compassion with us in everything, even the stuff that we really don't think he can. This is the God, this is the Lord and Savior who we serve. The next verse, the writer mentions that there are some things that are hard, um, but they need to be known and discussed, but that the writer will deal with in the next chapters. We'll continue <coughs> that next week. But in this first main part of chapter 5, we see that we have a true high priest who did not claim exemptions, but rather submitted himself completely to God in every single aspect of life. And so we see that Jesus' obedience and submission tells us how our lives can and should be lived. We can walk the path of Christ. We can choose to follow him regardless of what is going on. Jesus was there. He carved that path. He showed us what that meant, what that looked like, and now he calls us to follow him in it. Regardless of what we are feeling, regardless of how easy life is or how difficult life is, he calls us to follow Him. Not just because I said so. I had this, I had this discussion with my, my kids. And yeah, children probably had this discussion. I've said so. I don't need to explain anymore. I've literally used that line on Hayden on this week. I don't have to explain everything. I told you to do this. Just go do it. Sometimes that's appropriate. And by all rights, God could have done that. He could have said, I have said, I have spoken, go, I don't have to explain this anymore, just go. He had every right to. But he chose not to. He chose to come and live and have the full, complete human experience so he could show us that he could lead us so he could carve a path for us to follow in the God-man of Jesus Christ. And he now calls us to him today. And if you have not put your faith in Christ and washed by his blood and forgiven your sins by his power, then the, as we said last week, today is the day. If you have given up, if you have walked away, if you have given in to hopelessness and destruction, and the time to come to the only high priest, the only one who can truly and fully understand what you're going through, is today. He's the only one that can truly, fully help you through. Doesn't mean that he takes it all away and makes your life easy and gliding through the air. It doesn't mean that he can sympathize and carry us through every part of life. The good and the bad, the joyous and the depression, the light and the darkness, he can carry us through. Won't you turn to him? Won't you put your faith in him? Won't you live for him? Yeah. I'll stand.